it's all controlled from the bank. So, um, so there we go. Let's go.
Good afternoon and welcome to this service uh, of thanksgiving for the life of Jonathan Gledhill. Welcome to St. Mary Bredham, which was Jonathan's church. Uh, and on behalf of Jonathan's family, welcome to you all. Uh, I know they are so grateful for all of you uh, being here this afternoon. Just uh, one notice, because it is a church service, so we need one notice. Uh, the family invite you to stay after the service. Uh, there are refreshments. Uh, they'd love to uh, say hello to you, uh, and they really invite you to stay along to enjoy those refreshments. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet will they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let's stand together as we sing our first hymn. Would you like to be seated for our prayers? At the end of each section, after the words, Lord of life and love, would you respond, receive our thanks and praise. Lord of life and love, receive our thanks and praise. We come to you today with sadness at the loss of Jonathan, as much loved husband, father, grandfather, former colleague, friend, spiritual leader and more. Yet as we speak those words, sadness and loss, we know that this is only our side of the story. For Jonathan, his passing from this life is gain, not loss. New life, new health, and above all the fulfillment of all that he has lived for and put his faith in all these years. It is not sadness, but joy to be in the immediate presence of his Lord and Saviour. So, Lord of life and love, 
receive our thanks and praise. As we reflect on Jonathan's life and see how many are gathered here today, we are reminded of how much he has meant to so many people. And our hearts are filled with thanksgiving for the rich legacy he has left in so many places and people. We give thanks for his wise and gentle leadership as priest and pastor, especially here at St. Mary Bredin, where he laid the foundation for so much that you, Lord, have done in this parish and its people. His humility, prayerfulness, openness to the Holy Spirit and his servant heart have been an inspiration and example to many, and particularly to those of us privileged to have been working alongside him and learning from him as his curates. His willingness to entrust others with responsibility whilst being there to give guidance and encouragement where needed enabled others to grow and discover their gifts. He had an unusual combination of visionary leadership which gave others confidence to follow his bold decisions and yet a gentle pastoral heart sensitive to the needs of those who were hurting. Lord of life and love, receive our thanks and praise. It is testament to Jonathan's gifting as a leader that he became a bishop relatively quickly and ended up leading the largest diocese in the Church of England and taking a seat in the House of Lords. There is much that we know already of the fruit of Jonathan's life and ministry. There is also much more, however, that you, Lord, alone will ever know. We give you thanks that he can now rest in joy and peace in the abundant life which he entered, has entered with you and hear those words of affirmation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord of life and love, receive our thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you like to remain seated for our readings? The reading is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with songs of joy. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. John chapter 14. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God, believe also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself, so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way to get there? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me.
we've come to remember and to give thanks. Thanks for that man of faith and fun who each of us was privileged to know as parts of our life's journey, woven with his. And we take a moment to reflect not just on the churchman, Jonathan, but also on the family man and the friend who left his indelible mark on so many of our lives. As friends for over 40 years, our families were very close, and Folkestone and Canterbury vicarages became a haven for my children, who still remember Johnny's infectious laugh and his ability to create fun, up trees, scaling fences, campouts, swallows and Amazons escapades, and of course he was the creator of the famous mystery of the St. Mary bread in stolen candlesticks. I'm told he even pretended to like the flour and water pancakes cooked on the open fire. Johnny, the playmate, who taught his cousins and his children to play French cricket and who played a mean game of croquet with his grandchildren and invariably beat them in recent years, I'm told. And his grandchildren also remember games of sardines and hide-and-seek in that wonderful rambling bishop's house in Litchfield, which was where Grandpa taught them chess, too. And then Johnny the Enabler, one of Johnny's old friends from his ordination training days in Bristol, spoke of how he became student president in their second year. He wrote, He was made for that kind of role, I think. One of the best kind of leaders who are genuinely modest, with a strong sense of irony, and able to laugh at themselves. I guess that's what made him such a good bishop. And the present Bishop of Litchfield wrote, people here speak of his gentleness, his kindness, and his humility. Johnny's warm, encouraging acceptance of anyone he met helped him see potential in unlikely people. One friend who found a spiritual home at St. George's Folkestone writes, he was not someone who had a faithometer with a scale of naught to 10 by which people were judged. He offered a welcoming open door to all. And this resulted in a whole range of people joining in, sensing vocations and discovering gifts that they never thought they had. One previous church warden from St. Mary Bredin writes, I could see how God had equipped Jonathan to transform a church facing many difficulties into a beacon of light and hope in Canterbury. His approach was so warm and gracious, but he was also prepared to take a firm line where necessary. No wonder Johnny got involved in building extensions in both Folkestone and Canterbury churches to cater for the growing numbers and resulting in him later writing the book Leading a Local Church in the Age of the Spirit based on his own ministerial experiences. And then, of course, Johnny the Natty Dresser. There are photos to prove it. Whether it was the hats with character he could often be seen in outside our kids' primary school waiting for school pickup with lots of mums, or when occasion demanded it, he'd be seen in his shorts with shades, flares with moustache, not to mention sombrero with guitar. I love the story he told to daughter Hannah in one of his regular letters he sent to her at university, in which he recounts the tale of being dressed very smartly one morning in his Amazon 16-pound bargain suit, the shiny one, <laughs> all ready to speak at Christchurch College Eucharist. Sadly, when he phoned the chaplain to check the readings, he was told in a stony voice, it was yesterday. <laughs> Johnny may have been looking good, but he put the wrong date in his diary. And so to Johnny, the thinker and the dreamer. Undoubtedly, he sometimes seemed vague or absent, but perhaps these times of seeming retreat were where he recharged, enabling him to be the calm, quiet, thoughtful, and often visionary person so many of us admired. He'd found the skill of maintaining his equilibrium, causing him to be described so often in recent tributes as tolerant and forgiving. 
His children used to joke that the angriest they'd ever seen him was, was when he would come out of his study saying something like, has anyone seen my blue marker pen which seems to have disappeared? <laughs> His lack of concentration on the immediate task in hand could, of course, have its drawbacks. He himself recounted the tale of how he, as a young man, stopped at a motorway service station for breakfast, and how, deep in thought, instead of pouring himself a mug of coffee, he took the sign that said coffee before wandering off to a free table. <laughs> it took him some time to realize that there was something crucial missing from his breakfast tray. Johnny played the piano most days, often early or mid-evening. He accompanied his children when they played the violin. And they remember growing up listening to him playing Chopin, Mozart or Bach for pleasure as they went to sleep. No wonder that Hugh still finds music an important thread running through his life. And the piece from Chopin we'll hear later in this service was a piece that Johnny loved to play. And then... There was Johnny the Host, a familiar figure to all of us who visited the Gled Hills over the years in their many different homes. We won't easily forget the generosity and the hospitality that we received over those wonderful relaxed lunches, teas, suppers and breakfasts. Johnny and Jane formed an incredibly welcoming partnership and she seemed able to rustle up memorable, delicious meals out of nowhere in no time, even when in Jolly's early days as a curate, finances were tight. It was custom at meals in their home for grace to be said, with hands joined round the table as Johnny gave a simple prayer of thanksgiving. And somehow Johnny made that small ritual a normal thing to do, even involving firmly atheist teenage friends, before guests shared in the meal with all its chatter and its laughter. And of course, Johnny's generosity and hospitality were not limited to his own family's meals. He was passionate for social justice and he had a real concern for those who were homeless or marginalized, taking time to work with local charities in providing food, shelter and prayer if needed. He was a great listener, ready to give time to anyone who came to his door. He helped set up a local soup kitchen in Canterbury with other churches and local organisations. He lived out the gospel <clears throat> in his care for those pushed to the edge of our society. Details of today's collection for choirs for homeless people can be found at the back of your service orders. <clears throat> he was also keen to see women involved fully in the church's ministry relishing the opportunity to be present at Canterbury's first ordination of women as priests in our cathedral in 1994. Johnny the practical man. He was the dad who gave Reader's Digest DIY books to his kids when they left home, trying to help others to gain his confidence in doing something that needs doing by reading all up, uh, up about it and then having a go. Johnny became proficient in using a computer, moving from his trusted typewriter as times changed, just teaching himself at a time when many of his generation were slow to catch up. The blue painted TV cabinet, which still houses the Gled Hill TV, was an early carpentry project. And Johnny later developed a hobby of renovating and maintaining discarded and often quite badly holed sailing boats and canoes with mixed results, as daughter Hannah remembers, given her woman overboard experience. Johnny also taught himself how to rewire a house, a skill used very effectively in the family's little bolt hole cottage in Lyd. It was in his mid-years that Johnny found two sports he really liked, skiing and sailing. Escaping for a sail, and often a picnic too at Westbeer, just outside Canterbury, with family and friends, was a favorite way of unwinding. And Johnny, again self-taught as a sailor, loved introducing others to the sport that he enjoyed. His now son-in-law and now daughter-in-law both tell remarkably similar stories of one of their early meetings with Jonathan. Anil remembers sailing with Johnny into the path of an Isle of Wight ferry, <laughs> only to be saved by Hugh managing a sharp tack out of harm's way. 
And Sally tells of her early outing on a Gledhill sailing trip when she found Johnny breezily steering their little craft into the path of an ocean-going liner, <laughs> which was furiously foghorning them out of its way. As ever, Johnny retained his cool on both occasions and inevitably suggestion has been made that these sailing near misses were all part of his initiation rites for prospective partners of his much-loved children. And so to Johnny the preacher and the teacher. Johnny was one of those preachers who used personal experience, anecdote, illustration and humor to ground our understanding of the Christian gospel and present its challenge to us now. He made sense of difficult ideas in language that we understood, something I'm sure was appreciated when he visited many different countries as the Church of England's link bishop to the old Catholic churches of Europe. Here, his modern languages degree stood him in good stead in his preaching and his involvement in their concerns, making some lifelong friends along the way. I can never remember Johnny balking at unpacking a difficult text. And I echo another tribute from this church, which emphasized what was at the core of Johnny's theology in the phrase, Jonathan preached so wonderfully about the faithful love of God towards his people. <coughs> and Johnny was a good teacher. Whilst I was training at Canterbury School of Ministry, he made New Testament studies come alive as one of our lecturers, and I can still remember a series of Bible studies he led on the book of Nehemiah as we embarked on the building project at St. George's in Folkestone. <laughs> one of Johnny's greatest gifts as a teacher was his unfailing willingness to grapple with people's questions. I was a born and bred Methodist when, as a young woman, I came to worship at our local church, St. George's in Folkestone. And I really didn't understand quite a lot about Anglican liturgy. I was also always asking questions and must really have been very annoying. Why, I asked Johnny, do we all stand up together and face the altar when we say the words of the creed? It's not as if we believe that that's where God is. <coughs> and some 50 years later, I can still remember his answer. He spoke of us being people with a common focus, a common goal shoulder to shoulder, marching together, if you like, on the shared road of discipleship, united in our declaration of what we believe despite all our differences. It is an image given to me by a man who walked that walk, a fellow disciple who led us in our collaborative ministry by all that he was and did amongst us. So today we join in gratitude for his life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our next hymn, O Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder.
May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do take a seat. We meet today to give thanks for the life of Jonathan Gledhill. As Jonathan's successor here at St. Mary Bredon as vicar, it's a great privilege to lead this service today. It's also very illuminating and makes sense of the bits of boats that I found in the vicarage uh, garage uh, when we first moved here. I feel slightly underqualified to uh, speak today as I only actually met Jonathan on a couple of occasions. And yet, in many ways, I feel that I do know him by the legacy that he left here at St. Mary Bredin, in the lives that he shaped, in the community he led. Jonathan, as we have heard, left a godly legacy in the lives of so many and a a legacy uh, in the church here, a legacy we continue to benefit from, a legacy of faithfulness and faith. Many of the foundations of us as a church community here at SMB that we continue to benefit from were laid down during Jonathan's leadership of the church family here. And that's not only spiritual foundations, but also physical foundations. I think one of the photos that we saw earlier was of Jonathan down in the foundations of the church link building. Uh, doing his bit to lay those foundations. Our reading from John 14 has Jesus comforting his disciples. And Jonathan was one of those disciples. So many of the memories that people have shared with me about Jonathan speak of someone who who fully exhibited the fruit of the Spirit. As I was listening to the words that have been said about him today, I think I was able to tick off just about all of those fruit of the Spirit that that have been mentioned. These fruits are evidence of the Spirit's work in Jonathan's life. They are the fruit of Jonathan's discipleship. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples in John 14, wanted them to be confident wanted them to be certain in their status as his children and in their inheritance of eternal life. In looking at Jonathan's life, we can be confident in his discipleship and so utterly confident in his eternal inheritance. And so though today is a day of great sadness, we can still rejoice and praise God that his child Jonathan has been raised with Christ to glory, a place where there is no more pain or tears or sadness. For the child of God can be confident that, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, death's sting has been drawn and its victory has been defeated. Today we miss Jonathan, but we thank God for him and for a life well lived. We praise God for all that Jonathan meant to us and all that he gave to us. And ultimately, we can thank God for the hope that Jonathan had and the hope that every follower of Christ possesses, the certain hope of eternal life. That though our perishable bodies will fail us, we will be raised imperishable through the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. And that is what we remember today. In the sadness of this day, we remember that Jonathan is now in a place where there is no more pain, no more decay. Where Jonathan has been fully redeemed and fully restored, no longer subject to the frustration of decay that took its toll at the end of his life. Instead, he is now with his Savior. He is now with Jesus, praising him and enjoying eternal rest and peace, satisfied by the living waters, never to thirst again. In our prayers earlier, Nina referred to the parable of the talents, where in Jesus' parable, the king welcomes his faithful followers with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Those are the words 
with which Jesus welcomes home all his faithful disciples. Those are the words that he will have welcomed Jonathan home with. Today we say goodbye, but we also are grateful and thankful to God for Jonathan's life. And we say thank you to God. He sustained Jonathan in life and he has saved him for eternity. Well done, Jonathan. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enjoy your father's rest. Amen. Let's just have a moment of quiet as we reflect on maybe just one memory of Jonathan that we are holding on to and give thanks to God for that and for all that he meant to us. And we'll now continue our time of reflection as we hear Stephen play Chopin's Waltz No. 1 in A-flat major.
important he is as he went to sleep at night. So a beautiful piece of music to reflect to. The response to Lord in your mercy is here our prayer. Let us pray. God our Father, we thank you that you have made each of us in your own image and given us gifts and talents with which to serve you. We thank you for Jonathan, the years that we have shared with him, the good we saw in him, the love we received from him. This morning we commended Jonathan to you. Now give us strength and courage to leave him in your care, confident in your promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, surround Jonathan's family, Sue, Jonathan's mother, Jane, Hannah, Hugh, and their families, and all those who mourn his loss, with your comfort, Lord, and peace. We pray that they may not be too overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days, weeks, and months to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray that, encouraged by the example of Jonathan and all those who have gone before, that we may run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, so that at the last we may join those whom we love in your presence, where there is fullness of joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we now finish as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May I invite you now to stand as we sing that wonderful hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
Let us pray. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant to us, Lord God, to trust you not, not for ourselves alone, but also for those whom we love and who are hidden from us by the shadow of death, that as we believe your power to have raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, so may we trust your love to give eternal life to all who believe in him. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.